If you've been into film photography for just a little while, then chances are you are aware of the Olympus Infinity Stylus and maybe just the Olympus point and shoot cameras in general. Sometimes labeled as the Olympus MJU-1, which I've seen is said that it's pronounced Mu. This small, sleek little point and shoot 35 millimeter camera can be like one of the more popular ones out there and also sometimes very expensive. The Infinity Stylus was released in 1991 and was pretty popular. And also the 90s is like prime, prime time for classic point and shoot 35 millimeter cameras as we were slowly moving into a digital age, but there was still time for some really solid little compact point and shoot, throw it in your pocket, 35 cameras. These things were popular back then when they were released as well and sold something close to 5 million units. It was also the introduction of the Olympus Stylus models. There were things like Olympus Stylus Zoom and the Olympus Stylus Infinity Epic. The Infinity Stylus is definitely a pretty popular point shoot camera and I see it online a lot and I'm sure most of you guys do as well, along with ones like the XA and the Infinity Stylus Epic as well. But uh, is, is it worth it? Taking a look at some eBay listings here, I do see these things going for typically like 100 to $200, but I have seen them go for over $200 sometimes, which that's when I think you're paying too much for this. There are definitely cameras that are lower in quality than something like this that are still fetching like similar prices, if not more sometimes, just because. So let's do a review. Let's talk a little bit about the camera, what exactly you get when you pay those prices and some examples of stuff that I've shot with this thing. And I, I wanna talk about like, what, what is it worth it? The stylus is nice. It feels nice. It's super unobtrusive to both carry with you in a pocket as well as to use. I'm definitely a sucker for this little thing and I don't use it constantly. It's not always something that I'm dying to pick up and always have on me, but it feels nice when I go to use it and throw a battery in it and just toss a roll in and I can confidently know that it's gonna give me some solid results, which is what you want from a point and shoot camera. It doesn't feel like the most durable camera in the world, of course, and you could easily bash its brains out with a good rock or drop it off a bridge, I'm sure. It's got nothing on a solid SLR or a sturdy rangefinder, but that's not really the point of a point and shoot now, is it? I put a few rolls through my stylus at this point and generally I am really happy with these results. They look nice and sharp and clear. The camera is so small and compact that it's easy to just have with you and throw in your bag, your backpack and take with you when you're walking around or if you're out going camping or you're just hanging out with some friends. This stuff is just consumer film. So I mean, I'm shooting like gold and ultra max and color plus stuff that is meant to kind of go in point and shoot cameras. They pair really well together. There's a huge trend of people out there I think who are buying like point and shoot cameras and then putting things like Portra and Ektar through them exclusively. And that's where I say like get a nicer camera to take more advantage of those film stocks. Overall, I was getting consistently like in focus and sharp shots when I was shooting with this thing. But I did have more than a few instances on my stylus where just the autofocus was missing things. Lower light or outside in bright light, it just seems like the autofocus was just missing something that was right in front of it. And that might just be my own personal camera. But a big thing to keep in mind with these small, compact point and shoot cameras from over the years, like the 90s and the 80s, is that when they die or when things go wrong with them, they are not like repair friendly and they're not necessarily things that you're gonna find a lot of resources on for repairing them. If your autofocus is gone, if your flash isn't working, then there's not like a lot that I can really suggest just off the top of my head. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about buying one of these point and shoot cameras that have now kind of gone up in price. To get this thing up and running, we've got our battery compartment on the side here that takes a single, CR123 battery. With our battery in, we slide open the front door of the camera and it is super smooth sailing. It turns on right away and you can kind of hear the lens like spring to life and everything. On the back, we pop open our film compartment and of course, just loading a 35 millimeter roll in is super easy. You pop the canister in, you pull the film out just a little bit past the gate and then you tuck the end in here, close the door and it automatically does the rest for you. Film ISO is auto detected by DX codes on the canister of your film. So if you're bulk loading or buying something that 
that doesn't have this code, then you might encounter a problem. The camera will default to 100 ISO, which is the mass standard for most point and shoot cameras using non-DX coded film. And unlike certain automatic cameras, you don't have the option to manually input a different ISO. Besides that, we've got a built-in flash, solid autofocus, automatic advance and rewind, and shutter speeds that range from 1 15th of a second to 1 500th of a second. The stylus is loaded up with pretty much just like basic point and shoot camera features. Uh, most of the stuff you're gonna find on pretty much every uh, like 1990s point and shoot compact 35 automatic exposure loading kind of camera. Definitely one of the bigger sells and everything that I've seen and heard it talked about is that the stylus has a really solid lens on it. It's nice and sharp and it is a step up from other cameras released around the same time that might just kind of look the same and are similar point and shoot features and everything. It's a fixed 32 millimeter lens with a maximum aperture of 3.5. And it does produce some really great looking shots on this little guy. On the top, we've got our LCD screen that tells you when the camera is empty, how far you are into the roll you're shooting, and the flash mode that you're on. By default, the camera is always on auto flash when you slide the door open to turn it on. Pressing the flash button on top of the camera allows you to cycle through some flash options when you're shooting. Auto means that the camera is going to decide when to fire the flash and sometimes it does this even when you're outside if you're shooting in some shadow. This can be a little awkward if you're doing some discreet street photography and then this flash just fires. We've also got a flash setting for a pre-flash to avoid red eye. You can turn the flash off and you can also do a fill-in flash which will fire in bright light areas to kind of fill in some shadows. Really the only glaring annoyance with the camera is the fact that it resets the flash option every time you open or close the camera. So you turn the flash off you close up the camera, and then when you go to open it up again, the flash is back on. The biggest points in this camera's favor are probably the compact little design that people love, the good lens and good autofocus. It's a good little camera that is fun to use and easy to pick up and shoot with, and to some extent, the hype is like slightly justified, but there is so much hype for some of these little cameras. I don't think that I would really wanna pay two or three hundred dollars just to pick one up. I'm one of those people who lives every day blessed knowing that I found this for two dollars last year at a yard sale. And I wake up every day living my best life because of that fact. I'm kidding, not everybody has access to like thrift stores. Finding this stuff for cheap is hard. And uh, I know that there are people who are going to pay those prices. But maybe, just maybe, talk yourself down from something like that a little bit. There were so, so many point and shoot cameras released in the 80s and the 90s, and there is a wide variety of like, ones you've just never heard of before that are solid, and ones that are just like, you know, mediocre and whatever, get the job done, which is perfectly fine. Really, if you're just looking to buy a point and shoot camera, something small and fun to have with you when you're with friends or just out walking around, then buy literally anything? Obviously, yes, if you're a pro up and coming street photographer who is young and, and hip and wears their hat backwards and looks like they belong in a 90s beer commercial, then sure, buy one of these. It is subtle and quick to use and flashy, and if you're in a position to pick one of these up, then I don't think you're gonna be disappointed by any means. For most people though, like a super cheap point and shoot camera is definitely gonna cut it. There are so many things out there. Canon Sure Shots and Fuji Zooms. Things that are just fine even if they're kind of chunky or not as sleek and sexy as the Olympus models and the, the higher, more hyped up ones. They also won't destroy your wallet, which at the end of the day is something that if you're gonna get into film, I try and make smart decisions because there are so many different choices for what you can buy. And if you're spending like $300 on, a, on an Olympus point and shoot camera, then maybe consider the alternatives and what you could put that money towards instead. For beginners, I always recommend you should probably try and go a little bit further with your camera purchase. Pick up something that is going to force you to learn like manual exposure settings and the ins and the outs of overexposure and underexposure and working with the format of film. If you're serious about getting into film, then using one of those cameras 
is going to help you learn and grow and enjoy it more in the long run in comparison to just using a point and shoot like the Olympus here. Just some last words here. Uh, this camera was released in Japan as the MJU and then outside of Japan, it is the Olympus Infinity Stylus, which is what I have. The main difference really just being the door on the front that has the name of the camera. I do also have the Infinity Stylus Epic or the MJU2 as it is known by its other name. And I like this one as well. It's also something that I managed to just luck into. And I can definitely look at this as well in a specific video or maybe just compare the two because they are two of the really popular ones. In conclusion, I like this little camera a lot. And I'm on YouTube talking about film and you know you wanna buy one, so go buy it. I say go buy it, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. Thank you so much for watching. You can check the description below for the Analog Resurgence Patreon and the PO Box if you wanna support the channel or send stuff along or anything. I've gotta do some mail that I recently received and have not had a chance to show off in a video just yet. Uh, so this came all the way, I believe, from Denmark, if I remember correctly but it is this really gorgeous box of old, old educational glass slides. They are very, very cool to look at. I think they're all like history based uh, because there's such a variety of different scenes and images on these things, but they are filmed that are inside of these glass slides. So you would be able to take a look at them in a classroom, maybe go through a projector. I'm not like a hundred percent sure about these. I've meant to do a bit more research, but I'm gonna throw some scans in. And if you have um, experience growing up or, or, or you have come across stuff like this, then let me know a little bit more about this stuff. It is super nice. It's really beautiful to look at. There's also just an old roll of like printed slides as well on 35 millimeter, which is funny because they're actually old images of Canada. Uh, which is where I am from. There is a beaver and some reindeer, but also like grain silos and what I believe is Ottawa a long time ago. Like, so this stuff is really cool too. And uh, this was shipped by, I am so sorry, because I know this person comments on the videos a lot and their name is Soren. I, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but uh, they say, I'm a big fan of your work as well as your videos. Uh, I will skip past some of the, the flattery stuff, but um, this is a, an educational set of glass pane slides. Uh, there's also a battery lid for your Sankyo Super 8 camera. Oh yeah, I'm also gonna throw a shot of that in. This is super cool. I don't remember ever having the camera in a video. It must have showed up at some point, but I had this Super 8 camera that is like the second one I ever picked up and it was missing the battery compartment piece for it. And this person, they you send it along. So thank you so much for that because that's just something that I always thought would constantly be uh, just covered in, in black electrical tape. And a few prints of some highlights of my own work. And these are just some nice uh, four by five glossy shots on 35, I believe. I'm not sure how well that's gonna show up, but uh, pictures here of your own work. The slides had no documented age that I was able to find, but the spelling of some of the words are so ancient, I was told they would be labeled as incorrect by today's standards. If I had to guess, I'd say 1910 to 1920-ish, but maybe earlier. One of the slides depicts a railway with a steam locomotive in downtown New York. It's pretty old. This is incredible. These are really nice. I will scan some of these and just put them at the end of the video as I'm talking about them. But uh, thank you so much for that and for everybody who chooses and has the ability to send stuff along to the channel for the PO box. Um, maybe I'll try and show these off more in another video or just like talk about some old educational stuff. But thank you so much. And I will see all of you soon.